Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Wine and On. Once again, my name is Matthew Bowden, the Incredible Rogue. And today I'm very, very lucky and very blessed to have Shane Holtgren, the Space Cowboy. I'm going to bring Shane into the feed and we'll get started as soon as we can. Let's get rid of that. Hello, Shane. Pleased to see you, buddy. Hey, hey. Very good. Yeah, it's good to be here. So how's Oz treating you? Uh, Australia's good. Yeah, it's uh, the sun is shining. The yeah, the weather's nice, and um, yeah, feeling good. Cool, buddy. Yeah, so you're an Byron artist Bay, now. Which is a very um, kind of relaxed, yeah. relaxed town right on the beach, and uh, yeah, it's nice. Cool, buddy. So Shane, for people who might not know, has done some incredible things. First of all, he's one of the the most successful and effective power shows in the world. Secondly, he holds, if I'm correct to this date, 44 Guinness World Records. Uh, no, the current Guinness World Records that I hold is 55. Guinness 55. World Sorry. There you go. Yeah, so. And uh, as well as that, very <laughs> successful sideshow performer, I believe promoter as well. So today, hopefully, we'll gain a little bit of insight in why you took this path and what drives you and where you came from to do this and yeah. why you still do it today. So the beginning question is, what was life for young Shane like? Yeah, I guess I grew up in Byron Bay and I live, live here again now. And it's a very kind of free place. I mean, well, I grew up a uh, Mormon. So my, I've got um, five, uh, one of five kids, or, uh, I've got four sisters. And my parents were, were kind of, even though they're kind of strict religious, religious, they were very relaxed. And uh, we, yeah, so I had like, when I was maybe 10 years old, I had a little Kiwi 80 and I'd ride, ride around town on this little, motor, little petrol motorbike. And uh, we had a great Dane that was just, it was loose around the, around the town. And um, yeah, we, we left the church when I was, when I was like uh, eight or nine. And, then, and that was a collective decision through the family to, to leave the church. Yeah, 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 exactly. Okay. And I was very happy about that because I could finally busk in the markets because I was uh, unicycling and juggling already when I was when I was that young. I wanted to go to the markets because I saw people down there. So uh, before we go on to being eight yeah. years old and wanting to go and busk, why did you get into unicycling and juggling and all this kind of stuff? What was the impetus? Uh, my dad was a gymnast and okay. he knew how to juggle and he had some juggling clubs. And so he was just very encouraging. And then all the kids did gymnastics and my sister had a unicycle and I learned to ride that. So I was riding a unicycle to school, which was only, yeah, like 10 minutes ride away. And so I was in primary school, I was riding a unicycle every day. And uh, yeah, so it just kind of went from there. Okay. So, you left the Mormon church, so you're like, great, now I can go and busk. So at eight years old, you went down to a public square? Yeah, well, it's a, a field with a bunch of uh, marquees and food stalls and, <laughs> and all that. So I basically started by just riding around. Oh, I wasn't even really busking at the start. I was just riding around. But because Did you, Were you aware of busking? Like... Were you aware of busking or just having fun, having people watch you? <laughs> I don't know if I was aware of it then. So I rode my unicycle around the markets and then people would throw money at me and then I was like, oh, okay, well, I'm obviously doing something here. So I just kind of would stop and show off a little bit and then keep, keep riding. And then there was some street performers around. Uh, yeah, not many, but, but the, occasionally there was, there, was a, there was a guy on a tall unicycle um, forest uh, this American um, black performer who's, who was uh, uh, he had a really big street show and he was quite inspiring for me because he was uh, very kind of aggressive and very like he swore at his volunteers and was kind of like I was like oh Jesus I was Hold like on. well if he can if he can do that when being like not really nice <laughs> then, then uh, I want to I want to have a big show like that but I want to be really nice to people and so that's kind of so at this time when you were a kid were you were you cognizant of that were you thinking i really like this i like what's being done here but i want to do it differently or is that something you realize yeah, later on 
I remember asking one of the street performers because I, I started off, so I would just have a bunch of uh, objects that I would juggle one after the other. So I'd have some like, big kitchen knives that were like proper kitchen knives, <laughs> not blunted, the biggest ones that I could find at the second hand shop. And, um, and then some homemade fire torches and some fire balls and I had gloves and like, yeah, so I'd just do one one set after the other. I'd just juggle it, put it down, pick up another one, juggle it. And then I remember asking one of the street performers, how do you gather a crowd? And there was a street performer named Brett who was doing the straight jacket escape who um, gave me a whistle. And so I, I don't know if it helped, but I kept the whistle for a long time. But <laughs> Yeah. So uh, a couple of questions this one. First of all, what year is this? Uh, well, I'm 44 now. So I yeah, started busking when I was eight or nine. So it's 30, 36 yeah. years ago. So if we do the maths there, yeah, yeah, yeah. we're at 2003. <laughs> so that's 87. Am I right in that? No, 97. Would it be 97, 87, 87, 87? I want to say 87. Yeah, it's 87, right? Sounds right. It was just just before yeah. they did the um, big expos, right? Well, expo was eighty eight. Yeah, yeah, so, so that'd be a, a year of, before. Yeah, so there was a bunch of amazing acts that came to Brisbane for expo. I didn't um, see any street performers there, but uh, Captain Kino and Anthony Living Space kind of learnt a lot there. I think that might have been his inspiration for studying yeah. too. Um, um, uh, Andrew Elliott. Um, Lucky Rich. Uh, I heard Lucky Rich was a flower pot. My... Yeah, he was a flower pot, was he? Yeah, I heard he was. A, oh, I've yeah. been told the stories. He did a flower pot statue, which is interesting right. considering <laughs> the, the the huge menacing creature he appears to be now. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. I thought it was Greggles the clown. Could be, could be. Uh, maybe yeah. that's just another element. I haven't of the story. heard the flower pot. But... <laughs> I'll have to, it's one of the interviews. I'll have to trudge back and find it. Um, just to bring it back to you. So you're eight years old, you're unicycling, you're talking to other buskers. Why do you think you were doing that? Uh, I just had an insatiable urge to show off, I guess. I, I knew that, uh, I knew that I could make money from it, which was an enticement. I'd always been into like business, like even when I was, Really little. I was, I was selling lollipops at school and stuff like that. So, <laughs> so you got the grift. Yeah, yeah, yes. Fair Anything that could uh, turn a back, I was, <laughs> I was into it. And yeah. so, did you become what you describe as a pitch kid? Did you, after riding round and enjoying the attention, gravitate towards <clears throat> where buskers were working and sort of start associating there? Yeah, definitely. So there was a couple of pitches in. In my hometown, there was a there was this cafe. That, oh, so there was, but they were both on the same day. There was a market, and then after the market, a bunch of people would go to this cafe where it had this big outside area, and there was musicians and performers, and so we'd go there. Oh, you could do stuff at the at the top beach and stuff like that. So you're on the, in, the, in the park, um, which would be kind of any day, I guess. Um, but there was so Cavill Avenue is is kind of. Uh, it's uh, an hour away from my home. And so from when I was maybe 13 years old, I uh, would travel up there. Uh, so I joined this kid circus troupe. There was like four of us and we were just uh, playing around with, with circus props. And then uh, Jenny, the the lady who ran it, uh, was like, oh, let's go to, to Cavill Avenue and we'll see the buskers and we'll do a busking show. And... Uh, so there was two two of us in that group who were already doing, like young kids, we were already doing busking shows at the markets. So we were like, okay, we'll do a group show and we'll do our solo shows. And then there was like heaps of performers there. There was um, a Windsor, who's from from England, who became one of my like best friends, and I kind of lived with him in London, and we went to the pitch in Covent Garden for years and. Uh, yeah, was, there were so many performers there all, all rotating. I was like, oh, well, why is there so many performers here? And, and actually the council gave everyone free accommodation. Yeah. So from when I was uh, 13 or 14, they, I got my own uh, accommodation, like this little box apartment, which is just like two blocks away from the, the pitch at Cavill Avenue. And all I had to do was two shows a weekend. So I would catch a bus 
from school and I'd go up there and stay in my own, own little flat and watch the performers and do shows. How did that feel for a 14 year old? It felt very free. Yeah. I bet it did. You must yeah, have been the coolest yeah, kid in Win class. Yeah. Windsor, Windsor told me that uh, my, my mum was, I don't really remember this, but he said my mum was there on the first time that we went up to the Gold Coast with, with the kids that was teacher. And my mum saw Windsor and just said, oh, this is, this is my son, Shane. Um, can you can you look after him? I'm going oh. back to Byron. He wants to come up here and do street shows. It's like, wow. I mean, I've got a daughter now. <laughs> I don't imagine doing that with your little kid. And uh, it's, I mean, she didn't even know him at that stage. So, <laughs> yeah. Well, it sounds like you had very understanding parents. Yeah, yeah. Did, did they encourage, were they very, very supportive? Lucky. Yeah, they are. They've, they've always come to my shows, even when I'm doing like kind of really dangerous, crazy things. They're always still like, oh, I'm worried for you, Shane, but they're, they're, they're always there clapping in the front row. So. Yeah. yeah. So when you were 14 working on the Gold Coast, did you start believing this is my life? Did you have that moment of this is what I am now? Definitely. Yeah, from w when I was really young, I, I knew that I would be a performer and I, I had a feeling that I would never do anything else which is, yeah, quite interesting, I guess, because most people don't really know what they're going to do. And I, I never knew, I, I, I never didn't know what I was going to do. So. so in the Gold Coast, your show is still quite strappy. It's with lots of odd bits, I assume. It's, it's you still discovering how it is to perform, right? Uh, oh, to be honest, I'm, I'm not really <laughs> doing street shows anymore. Yeah. But but when you but were at the Gold Coast, when you were doing it oh, back when then, when you were 14, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, and there was, um, so Cabal Avenue, right on the pitch, there's, a, there's this huge Ripley's Believe It or Not Museum as well. And that was kind of a big inspiration because I was so into Guinness Book of Records and the Ripley's Believe It or Not books. And yeah, I was, from when I was really young, I was trying to work out ways to break a Guinness World Record. And then, so Ripley's would let us in there all the time and, and yeah, just loved going through that museum and on, on the time off from street shows. And I guess I, that, that's part of the reason why I have such a variety of skills as well and, and Guinness World Records is because just I had all that inspiration from such a young age, seeing all the amazing characters in the books and the, the museums and then the performers on the pitch. And it was all just kind of, like, oh, yeah, I, I just wanted to have one act. I want to just, I, w I want a real variety. I want to do as much as I can. And so how did you evolve after the Gold Coast? What happened after that? Uh, so then when I was 16, I was like, oh, I want to go um, overseas. And then my parents said, no, you're too, you're too young. So I drove to Perth, which is like 50-something hours. <laughs> drive and yeah stayed there for a few months busted in free Fremantle and on the way in Adelaide and Melbourne and Sydney and and then yeah drove all the way back again busking all, all the way and and then by that time I was 17 so then I was old enough for my parents eyes to go to the UK and do shows okay and so when you hit 17 did you pack your bags and go immediately yeah why the UK yeah. Oh, because that was where, that was where Windsor was, and he was like, "Oh, you can come and stay with me." And we've got Covent Garden, we've got Pitch, and uh, well, I'm actually half American, so I got an American passport as well. But it, it was always very easy to, uh, as an Australian, to uh, work in America uh, in in the UK. So I never had any issues with that, and also every year we we're like booked for. Glastonbury Festival, and then they've got the visa waiver for the festival and stuff, stuff like that, which makes it very easy. So, yeah. And yeah. did was in the Gold Coast that group was supportive of you? Then that group was someone who nurtured you. Yeah, definitely. And so, did you have a sense of the continuation of that going to London and working in Covent Garden? You felt like yeah, it was definitely like a, a family, with a, a brat pack family for sure. Yeah. <laughs> and was your show? for want of a more descriptive term, pumping before you went to Covent Garden, before you left when you were 17? 
Uh, yeah, well, I was doing um, whip cracking. I had a, a straight jacket. I had a um, bunch of different juggling acts. I had a tall unicycle. And I did have a solid show. I, yeah, I was, I was making enough to buy my own flights and pay my own way from when I was quite young. Looking back now, do you think there's things then that needed improvement that you didn't know then, things you learned on the journey that you can see now specifically <laughs> in that time, you think, oh, what the hell was I thinking? <laughs> uh, yeah, there's always, when you look back at old videos and things like that, of, of, uh, but that's part of the time, isn't it? And, you know, maybe it was appropriate then <laughs> saying those lines or doing those things or wearing those <laughs> crazy costumes. <laughs> and so when you went to Covent Garden when you first arrived there what was the experience when you first got there it's a new city first time you've left Oz I assume how was it it was epic I mean I, I already knew a bunch of people there I felt like I was really in because you know I was driving to the pitch every morning with Windsor and yeah Pepe was uh, was most of the time was was sleeping in Windsor's floor, so he came in with us in the morning as well. And there was always street performers coming in and out, and it was just felt like, yeah, we were kind of, you know, the the boys of Covent Garden. Yeah, it was yeah. it was really cool. You felt like, as you described it before, like a brat pack. Yes. And how long did you spend in Covent Garden? Uh, I, I always travelled the festival circuit, so I, I kind, of, kind of, yeah, I really like festivals rather than just staying on one pitch all the time. But also I had, had a van and I would travel it around, and so I, I, I knew that when you're travelling around, like, the UK or Europe, you, whatever city you're in, you just look for the, the tallest cathedral steeple and then, you, and then there'll be a pitch within that kind of block. And so even if you didn't really know, you know, you've never been to the city before, you haven't even heard if there's a pitch there, you can generally find somewhere that you can do a show like that. That's a bit of advice um, for you, I everyone. Guess the, what was that? I said that's a bit of advice for everyone watching. Look for a cathedral. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I wonder if it's, um, if it's still like that. But I think it's getting a bit tougher for street performing. Well, I think a lot of tables and chairs have come into public squares, more public space have been controlled. You were very lucky, I think, of working through a time where it was a kind of golden age where it had just become big, it had just blown up. And I think yeah, you, were, yeah. you were kind of, the, the explosion had happened and you were being carried through with the, the, the aftershock of that explosion in the 80s. Yeah, I believe so. Uh, yeah, I guess that's part of the reason why I don't really do many street shows anymore or I definitely don't um, go looking for pictures or uh, I just go where I'm booked so if there's a street performing festival who books me then then I'm happy to do it but uh, but even that I, I guess I'm, <laughs> I'm generally yeah si or since COVID as well now I'm more happy to just be at home and painting instead of uh, traveling enough. so yeah. Well, we'll get to that a, a bit more later on in the interview. But let's look yeah. at this time when you're travelling around in the van. What did you feel about your life at that time? What were the qualities that you appreciated that were embedded within your life at that moment? Uh, it was epic. I mean, it was just such kind of, I guess, cheap living. And, like, you, you could you have your own accommodation with you, you're kind of like a snail just travelling around. You can go slow or as fast as you want. Uh, the festival circuit was just so incredible. It was just like so rewarding. And every time, well, cause I would follow the, the summer. So I'd go to the UK for, for the summer, so three or four months, and then come back to Australia and then just kind of zip off everywhere. But yeah, so I spent most time in Australia, but you know, maybe four months a year in, in the UK. So uh, it felt like a never-ending summer. It was just always fun and good times and big shows. Well, you seem like an incredibly positive person, and it it's quite hard, and I think you'll probably find it quite uncomfortable to think, but were there obstacles at that time? Were there things you found 
difficult, particularly at the beginning. You've gone to Covent Garden, you've started traveling around. What were the challenges you had? Uh, to be honest, yeah, I didn't have too many challenges. I found it quite easy. I mean, there was some performers who you kind of <laughs> have a bit of conflict with, but generally I got along with most performers as well. So there was only, <laughs> I guess it was, <laughs> yeah, only a, only a few of them. Yeah. And do you feel like they were just having conflict with everybody anyway, and you just happened to be within their yeah, remit? I think so, yeah. Okay, fair enough. They they were conflict driven yeah. people. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's 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 cool, man. So, how many years did you do that for? How many years were you traveling around for? Until COVID. Okay, so, so like from then yeah. to, to now, but there must have been yeah. Or, or, there must have been changes I, through that time. I kind of yeah. So in two thousand, I made the show with. Uh, with three other performers it was called Happy Sideshow and we, were, we basically I made the show in, in England was Cap, we met Captain Frodo in Norway and it was Shep Tiger Wolf Frodo and anyway we we Great went to Edinburgh Festival and then we were, we were street performing and like giving out flyers in our street shows and then we went into our venue show at night and then that was kind of like a bit of a change in my mindset of like, like oh okay I really, I really like doing indoor stuff now and you can kind of supplement it through street shows as well and advertise it. it's kind of free advertising while you're making money and and then do the shows at street shows, the theater shows at night and so that was really fun and then toured that show around for, for many years and then started doing solo shows and then did solo shows in theaters for years so then really now i'm just a festival performer uh, rather than kind of a traditional like busker who would just travel so, around and find pictures draw, and queue up and yeah exactly so to draw back to the street before we move on to the festival work and the the indoor work what was it you said earlier on you were you wanted to make a show that was friendlier and it sounds very much like you you had some kind of um mission or ideal that you wanted to hit in your shows can you explain that a bit more yeah, I, I guess there was a lot of aggression and testosterone in a lot of the street shows back then, and and I just didn't really like that. I've just always been really placid. I like to get along with like everyone. It? <laughs> was it was it just against your nature, or was there something more more um, kind of? There was there a logic behind that as well as just a feeling. Well, for the same reason that we called the happy side show the happy side show. So we. It was actually in, so it must have been 98 in Edinburgh Festival, we, or 99, we saw this show, the Kamikaze Freak Show, which was this amazing, inspirational, life-changing moment seeing that show. And there was John Kamikaze, who was the, the main guy, who was the, the host and the main performer, and he was the human pincushion. And his costume was 350 hat pins and hypodermic needles just completely covered. Wow. And then there was Pinky Pinky, the hermaphrodite accordion player, uh, there was um, Power Tool, he was a penile phenomenon. He was a dwarf who would pull uh, people across the stage with his penis. And then uh, there was, it was uh, or Amy Misbehave was in that show, who was a strip performer as well. Sword she swallower. was a sword swallower, she was called Trash. And it was such an amazing show, uh, really theatrical, really dark, sinister. And... Uh, you know, a lot of the, the acts and the stuff that I really love. Uh, and after watching that show, I was like, oh, yeah, this is, this is what I want to do now. But I want to do it really positive. And so then we made the show called The Happy Side Show. So it was, it was a, a retake on, on kind of the, the aggressive kind of, now I'm going to do this and I'm a freak. And instead of that, it was like, it, it was a really celebration of, differences and celebration of uh what we can do with our bodies and stuff like that instead and it was uh, it was a real hit we toured that for many years we did multiple seasons in the sydney opera house and all sorts of amazing venues and yeah it was really cool so why do you think it's important to in freak shows for example something that's kind of epitomized in some ways by the idea of oh it's dark it's difficult it's painful Ugh. 
why is it important to put something together that's positive and happy? Well, well, I like both of it. Um, but for me, I always wanted to perform positive things. I want to, I guess I just want that to be part of my life. And I, I've always had, always had the idea of like, if you're an actor and you play, you know, some gruesome murder or character or pedophile or some kind of horrible person, it, when people see you and they're like, oh, that's that person, you, you know what I mean? It, it relates to you and it comes into your life. And uh, so, so there's a performer um, of Betty Braun, Charmaine, and so I did this training workshop with her before. Uh, she wasn't a street performer. She wanted to make a strong lady act, and so she asked me to help her with the act, and she wanted to play this kind of really shy character, and I was like, no, that's, that's out. You're going to be, I'm Betty Braun, the strongest lady alive, and then it kind of, I, I think that, and now she's, she's been touring that show for years, and she's such a positive happy person and her show is really positive her show the whole show is about positivity and and it uh, i've got a feeling that that changed her and i've got a feeling that it's changed me the way that i have performed and do you think it changes people who watch in your audience having something which they can watch which has got a positive framing as opposed to say for example my own character is based around negativity it's meant to have positive <laughs> turns on it but it's it's kind of yeah, yeah, yeah. consumed by this negative character that you can then make positive influences from and you know i believe there's some insight in that but do you believe that having this positive character bleeds out into the audience into their day into their frame of mind yeah, uh, I guess if you if you see a horror movie, then you become scared. If you see a sad movie, you you cry. And if but there's there's a time and place for all of that, and they're all they can be beautiful, moving experiences, and and you know emotions are part of our life, and you want to explore all of them. So having a street show with a different different emotions involved is just as valid as having a purely positive celebration show it's just that's what i always wanted to do and it seems like you've carried that through through your street performing career and just one thing before we move on completely from street performing to move on to the festival work and the indoor stuff completely how much did you have to train for stuff i mean you do double whip work which is astonishingly good um your chainsaw juggling is very very good you're juggling on the unicycle really good everything you do it seems that you do it utterly competently how much did you train for that? How much work goes in behind the scenes to to actualize that? Yeah, I guess because I've been unicycling so long, that is just like riding a bike. It just feels so natural, you know. So uh, same with juggling. And then, but when I'm working on something, I remember when I first started chainsaw juggling, I was just obsessed with it. I was like, oh, I'm not. I don't want to just juggle a chainsaw i want to do three chainsaws i want to do tricks i want to do uh, chainsaws on the unicycle i want i want to push it as far as i can and so i, I would do training sessions every day and I'd, I'd, I'd train i made some big props that would be the weight so they'd simulate the chainsaw and uh, which didn't work out so good because actually you need the centrifugal force of the of the engine and uh yeah but, but i guess building strength. what if yeah, so we'll, we'll actually, it's more uh, movement and flow and kind of like martial arts, how you use the, the movements of your opponent to, to take, move their body weight and stuff like that. Same with the chainsaw. If you're, if you're fighting it, so, so most chainsaw jugglers, they go, and it's really hard. But if you watch me juggle, I'm kind of moving, I'm flowing, and I use the motion. The, so, the so it's like a lever. Motion. Yeah, yeah. So, so really, um, I do like a really crazy routine with back crosses, swinging, and I'm not breaking a sweat. You know. <laughs> cool, man. And so you do you do hours every day for all the different stuff. And did you keep that going through majority of your time working on the street, or did you put loads of hours in at the beginning and then what many people do is they get the stuff yeah, no, right I just, and I then just kept it up. Yeah, because I was okay. if I wasn't um, training for the skills that I had, I was working on new acts or making new props, and just every day I was 
I had a mission of like, okay, today I'm doing this, and I was just always were you partying? I've always been like that. Because I think partying gets in the way of that training regime. So did you go out and party and have a good time? Were you going out till all hours at night and training at the same time? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> how did you manage that? You, how... you can get away with it. <laughs> Youthful exuberance. And I take it as you got older, yeah. the partying diminished, but the training stayed stable. <laughs> uh, I still like to party on weekends and, and have, yeah. Yeah, I guess uh, I like a, a mix because, you know, uh, life is a celebration and you want to, like, party is such a part of my life. You know, and with it, without that, uh, I think it would be quite boring, like, you want to be with friends and you want to celebrate and you want to dance and and stay up late and but then i guess that's part of the beauty of being a self-employed artist is then you but what you did that was different is you did that but you also kept a really strong and good work ethic and i'm interested at where that work ethic comes from do you reckon it was instilled by your parents because they were athletes uh yeah probably as well because my my dad gave us all uh, goal setting challenges as well, and so we would. Uh, he was quite obsessed with that actually. From when when we were really young, we were always setting goals, and and we had to achieve goals if we want to like get a certain amount of money, or if we want to be able to do this, go on this trip, or whatever. And yeah, I've kind of always kept that as well. Well, that makes complete sense that you were you were socialized as a young man into having this goal minded um, kind of mind frame and you acquired the knowledge of working and achieving that. And that's carried you to be incredibly successful for your whole life, it seems. Very interesting. So when you started doing the sideshow and you started traveling around with the sideshow, did your life change? Uh did it, did it change? I mean, I, I kept up the same lifestyle, really. I, there was, I was still, you know, jet setting. It was just I had a, a crew now instead of, instead of like, I mean, it, I always had a crew, like I had a family, but like street performers, but, but it wasn't like we're all, we're all in this together. So it was really nice having the, the Happy Side Show because we were literally like, you know, a family pack we could go off and do our own uh, shows and whatever, but we always knew, okay, we're, we're doing this show together. We rehearse together. We, yeah. Yeah. It was and nice. Who dealt with the promo and doing all the admin and that kind of stuff. Was it shared between you all? Did you have a person that did the admin? Did you pay a private? Yeah. At the start we did, but then we took on this guy, Scott Maidment, uh, who was a real estate agent who, who kind of took us on, he wanted to get into the entertainment business. And then he became our manager for uh, maybe maybe six years, something, something like that. Um, and then he, he took on a whole bunch of other shows, uh, started the, uh, his, his business was Strut and Fret, and then they started this big garden in the, um, Adelaide Fringe Festival, the Garden of Unopened Delights, which is now the main hub of of um, Adelaide Fringe, and then he has all these kind of big, big touring shows that, that are around. So, uh, yeah. So I guess yeah, we, we had our day with him, and then we kind of we kind of split, and then uh, uh, just before you go on, just before you go on to that, mm. so you guys were doing the admin yourself, booking, trying to find venues, sorting all the stuff out. Was that stressful for you guys as a group? Was it a difficult thing to operate between each other? Because everyone's uh, kind of half messy if you're coming from street performing, at least. It's something where you don't need to be that together. Yeah, to well, not everyone was team. doing the 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 bookings and stuff like that, so the admin. Like, But it, it was quite easy as well because of our street theatre history. We already had all these contacts and we knew what festivals we were going to go to. And then we were like, Oh, oh, so we're, we're going to this festival and then we talked to the organisers in Glastonbury and whatever and they're like, oh, yeah, of course you're in. And so it was it was quite easy because we were already on the circuit, you know. Cool, man. And 
when you got the agent, was it just much of the same? Just you didn't have to worry about that stuff anymore that got dealt with? Did it dramatically uh, change the yeah, dynamic? Yeah, it, it, it did change it a lot because then it expanded our worlds because then we toured Japan and Italy and, like, it, it, yeah, we went all around. So instead of just our normal festival circuit where you could do street shows and then the occasional like big music festival or whatever it was more kind of theater festivals or, or just in a big theater in in spain or whatever yeah and when you were writing the shows together did one person take point and sort of do the main overarching choreography of everything and the structuring or was it was it like yeah. a committee meeting oh it was definitely uh yeah, committee meeting. everyone was involved uh, Captain Frodo was definitely the kind of instigator of his, he had such a creative mind and, and yeah, he was in charge of the music, but he was also, uh, he had a lot of the, the really good ideas about, you know, how, how the acts will become more theatrical and kind of moving it in the way that of the, to make it fit more into the big theatre shows. That we and of course doing. he had, he had so much experience of that because he came from a, a family of maybe his dad was a theatrical magician. He worked in theaters yes. and yeah. Frodo he was still his is. child. And they, they do yeah. shows together now. It was still really to cool. this day. Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. We just went and visited them in Norway, which was really nice. It, yeah. Frodo's got a daughter, which is just a couple of years older than, than my daughter. So they get along really well. And that was, well, that, that must nice. be lovely. People you toured with before, like friends on the the circuit, and now you're all meeting up and your kids are playing together. That must be one. Yeah, yeah. Beautiful experience. So you started that in 2000. Am I right about that? Yeah, yeah. The first Happy Side Show was at uh, Lizard Festival, which was in Cornwall during the eclipse. Oh, wow. Which the whole festival went uh, bankrupt. Oh, so there was some weird thing where... The government had some evil, evil play on on all the festivals during that time because they all the radios were were saying oh, the the roads are blocked, don't go to Cornwall, like it's crazy, you're never going to get in, and we just drove in totally fine, and then all the festivals were empty, even though they were like had wow. a lot of them sold heaps of tickets, but no one no one turned up, and anyway, uh, so there was a whole meeting at the start. With, with all the performers at the at the festival and they're like, okay, we've declared bank bankruptcy and we're not going to do the show. And then uh, Frodo stood up and said, but will the eclipse still be happening? And, ah. and they're like, yes, yes, it will. And they're like, oh, yes, okay, well, we'll do our shows anyway. And, um, I mean, it was it was, it was was hard. Like we, we had friends that brought these big troops, uh, turbos on and they brought all these uh, fire trucks and cranes and things. And huge drove, expense, drove I assume. Down. From because, Spain, because the and payment, they were like not getting paid. Yeah, yeah the yeah, payment exactly. comes after then, the festival, right? Yeah, yeah. But then we also knew that a uh, bunch of the bands had already been paid, and that was like, ah, oh, you know. But it was it was an amazing festival, anyway. <laughs> yeah. And how long do you guys run the show for? And did the show change on stage as it went through? Did it was there a dramatic shift, or did it become more theatrical as time went on? Was there a was there a progression, or was it quite static and just moving bits around? Uh, yeah, no, we purposely made uh, different shows, so we we had oh, maybe five different shows that we made. So, I mean, at the start, it was very kind of anarchy kind of rock and roll show and then it became more theatrical but then we were like okay so now we're going to do a show it's called uh, three piece suit with a sideshow lining and then it was all we kind of made this big bar and we had this fire scene at the bar and then it was kind of more of a, a theater show and kind of yeah so whatever uh yeah i guess we, we every year or something we were like okay so now this new show is going to be this and yeah so you wrote a different show every year. You didn't just make something that worked as a formula and then tore the death out of it. Yeah, no, that's correct. Yeah, we made different shows. Yeah. <laughs> and how long? How long was the rehearsal time to make these shows? How many weeks were you developing this stuff before you'd take it onto a stage? Uh, well, it depends because we were kind of. It was all renegade as well so we never did any funding or anything like that. we only made money from street shows and from tickets so we yeah 
when we weren't doing shows, we were like, okay, we all got together and we'll work on routines and you know, it was kind of like that. We'd rent out a, a warehouse and if we need more space and we'd kind of uh, do a kind of week intensive or whatever. And yeah, so it really depended on on our budget and our time between festivals and all that kind and, of stuff. And so I assume the first time you take the show out, once you've done the prep, it's a bit rough and ready. It's still discovering it, still finding out how everything works. Uh, surprisingly, I mean, we did some re really kind of, kind of horrific uh, like tech runs, but every time we did the show, we just nailed it. <laughs> yeah. we were even like sometimes we just arrived in this new country and half our props are gone and our tech our tech rehearsal is just like all gone to shit and then they're like okay oh we're, the crowd has to come in now they're waiting they've been waiting and it's like okay and we would just walk off and then we come back on and we just fully rock it <laughs> yeah i don't remember ever doing a doing a show where where it was kind of fell apart <laughs> Do you think that's because you guys had had all that experience of working on the street and working with chaos that when it came to having the crowd there and the pressure was on that you guys just stepped up? Yeah, yeah, exactly. You got to be ready for anything on the street, and if you if you can do that, then you can perform anywhere. Yeah, cool. Um, one of the things I think the street doesn't give you very well though is the the crowd dynamic in a in an indoor venue is very different from the street. Am I right in thinking that? It's very different. Uh, yeah, I guess the thing is with street shows is you need to be well. You need to be entertaining the entire time, otherwise people will leave. But a street show really relies on expectation for what's going to happen. So, so a street show, in order for a street show to get bigger and bigger, rather than dwindle or have walk-offs during the show, it's the whole show needs to have the premise of I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that, uh, stick around because I'm just doing this as a warm up because in the a hook. second, <laughs> yeah, the hook, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, which you don't need in a theatre show. You can stand there as long as you want because <laughs> they've already bought their ticket. <laughs> but I am also correct in thinking this that it's to a detriment <clears throat> on an indoor show to be hyping something so much and selling it and drawing it out and getting the crowd to applaud before you do things. All these very typical street performer techniques actually undermine a piece of work indoors. They can do, yeah, definitely. Uh, well, that's the thing, you don't need it, but it can work as well. Like I, I do a lot of hype moments in my show, to warm up the crowd and, and uh, whether I'm in the in the street show or in the theatre, but you know, over in a theatre, you can just just kind of casually walk out and talk to them instead of uh, instead of have the expectation of what's going to happen and and all that kind of stuff. Like they're there for a reason. They bought a ticket. They know they want to see you, and they're not walking away. So <laughs> yeah, they have your and, undivided attention. And so, how long did you run it for? From two thousand to to what date? Oh, that was a bad show. Uh, I'm not I'm not exactly sure the year that we finished that. But it might, maybe it's 2007 or something we we finished. And why? Um, uh, we were all ready to go our own ways, and uh, yeah, we lost our management. We were doing our own shows anyway. And yeah, it was time. We, we toured together for a long time. We're, we're all still really good friends. So it was amicable. Yeah. It wasn't like the break of a marriage and it was very fractious. There was nothing like that. Oh, oh well, we were like a family. So there's, it wasn't free of, of arguments and tension. But yeah, we, we all love each other and we all, we all get along. So it wasn't, it wasn't because of that. Did you feel sad in 2007 when it ended? Did you feel like you'd lost something? Uh, yes and no. Uh, I felt excited as well uh, for new adventures. Uh, I guess I, I never thought, like, this is the end, you know. It never felt like that. It just uh, it kind of turned into something else. 
And so how did you move forward after 2007? You said new adventures. What was the new adventure? Uh, well, I was already doing my solo street, uh, solo uh, theatre shows. I had a, a mind reading show uh, called Mind Bending, which is like spoon bending and thought reading, and, uh, which I mixed a bit of kind of stunts in there, as, like kind of uh, on the premise of like this is all with mind power. And, and then so that was quite a successful show that I was touring around. And I really loved doing that as well. And did you keep um, that on plus, the boil while you were doing the side show, while you were doing the happy side show? Uh, yeah, well, I was learning all the skills while I was doing the Happy Side Show, and so I was making shows, and, and uh, yeah, I was still I was doing shows as well. I mean, the Happy Side Show was our main uh, production, but I was also doing my own things in between. So, and had um, the record breaking yeah. started at this point? Um, yeah, oh no, I didn't have any Guinness World Records during the Happy Side Show reign. Uh, so my first Guinness World Record was in 2008. Was that okay, so it's swords? very quickly Seven, after. Yeah, 17 swords at the same time I swallowed. Okay, and, and how, then, what, how and why did you set yourself up to do that at that moment? Uh, oh, so we, we've been touring with the Krusty Demons, which is this big motorbike stunt show. They do like a freestyle motocross and backflips and all that. And so we started working with that with the Happy Side Show, and then I... I continued on so I actually was even in Dubai with them a few months ago so uh, yeah so oh what was that question sorry so uh, it's it's how and why did you do the 17 swords swallowing you know, oh, what so was, the, oh, yeah. so what was the, the idea of it why were you driven to do oh, that well, what did you want to well, change I knew from? that I wanted to break Guinness World Records from when I was a kid and I, I even remember like practicing uh, some records that I was that I was going to break when I was like you know in primary school, but I never actually did it because of the the convoluted process of uh, filling in all the forms and all that kind of stuff. And I don't, I don't know why I didn't break any Guinness World Records during the Happy Sideshow times, but there was uh, so we were working with the Krusty Demons, and then we did this big show. Uh, called the Night of World Records, which was in Melbourne, uh, 30,000 people. And this, and the whole premise of the show was it was like we're breaking a, as many world records as we can, the longest motorbike. And Guinness is there, there and they're already there yeah, set yeah. up. They're waiting. So it's the best invitation for you to do this you could have, right? Exactly, yeah, yeah. So I broke two Guinness World Records on that night. So one was the most weight suspended from a swallowed sword and the other one was swallowing 17 swords at the same time. And then after that, so I got, I kind of got. So in before we, before we go on after that, how did you yeah. prep for for both of those tricks? Because sword swallowing, if I'm correct, can be dangerous, right? <laughs> yeah, yes, it can be. Um, well, I'd been, I'd already swallowed seventeen swords. I just hadn't officiated it with Guinness records. So, um, so I, so I had, I had my stack. Well, actually, maybe I hadn't swallowed seventeen. Maybe I'd swallowed fifteen or something. And like had that. you seen someone else before? Because I assume when you're swallowing 17 swords, there's some kind of mechanism to hold them still so they don't slice up your insides or pinch you. Am I, am I right in thinking uh, that? No, well, at, at the beginning, it was all kind of you have to swallow one sword at a time. But then the, oh, so the record that I hold now for the most sword swallowed is 29 swords. And you can't swallow them individually because it just gets like too crazy. Um, so basically, they're all just just taped together, just to, in a stack, and then squeeze them all together in the bottom, put, push them down the throat. But in order to do that big stack, I have to stretch my throat with hoses for three days. So I do um, a meditation and internal isolation to swallow hoses and just kind of just uh, slow. I do that for three days, and then I can swallow the 29 swords. Um, yeah. Why were you driven to learn how to sword swallow? It's quite a, it's quite an uncomfortable thing to learn. I tried it myself and I got past the first, because there's three gag points. Right? Oh, yeah, there's yeah. a gag point in your neck, uh, your throat at the top, middle of your throat and by your stomach, right? Yes. And they're all absolute misery to get past. <laughs> it's not a fun thing to learn. Yeah. Why no, it wasn't a fun it? thing to learn, but I, I guess, well, I, I first uh, saw a sword swallower Oh, there were two sword followers that came through Cavill Avenue in the Gold Coast. Uh, one was Andrew Elliott, the other one was Matt, Matt's 
Matty Blade, I uh, can't remember his last name. Um, and uh, oh, at the time I, I thought, oh, wow, that's really cool. I probably didn't think that I was going to be a sword thrower at that stage. I was just kind of into my own kind of circuit skills and stuff. And then after seeing the Kamikaze Freak Show in Edinburgh Festival, I was like, oh, yeah, I need to get more freaky and I need to learn sword swallowing. So you thought so, I would have bit of that? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> How long did it take you to, to master it, to get it to the point where you're not gagging and you're comfortable with it? Uh, oh, well, it was probably just a few months before I did it in the show, but then it was just like a simple sword swallow. Um, yeah, I, I hear all sorts of stories about pe people learning sword swallowing and some people oh, never get it after years of years of training and other other people I get it quite quick. So I got it quite quick. It was a few months uh, and it was in my show. And, yeah, and then I just got obsessed with it. I just was like, okay, what can I do to make this, you know, more unique? More, and so I made all these kind of crazy designs and, uh, yeah, big hedge clippers where they um, swallow them and then kind of, uh, kind of open them inside. Uh, the sword blade I put into an electric drill and set the handle on fire. So when I swallow it, put a rubber band around the trigger, uh, squeeze it in and just goes spinning around, around my head. Um, that was the finale of our Hackside show for a while where I had two big angle grinders shooting spark at me while I swallow this flaming electric drill that spins around. And one time in Spain, uh, it was a new electric drill and, and I didn't realise how powerful it was. And I cried in my teeth and spun in my throat as it came out. And um, I was like, that was the, it was the last moments of the show. And so I pulled the blade out and I'm like, oh, shit. And then, uh, and then at that point, everyone steps forward and we bow. And that's the, the last bit. So I'm bowing, my mouth's full of blood and walk off stage. And I uh, yeah, got rushed to hospital and uh, swallowed an endoscope. And luckily I didn't puncture anything. Otherwise it's kind of automatic infection and really bad. So I was yeah. just really raw and sore for... Well, I've heard some while. people um, have problems where they end up slicing bits of their stomach and then you have to have surgery, right? You have to open your stomach up and stuff like that, which is very unfortunate. Yeah. I don't really want that. No, that doesn't sound very nice. No. Um, mm. And I did have a, I had a, I've had stomach laceration and the um, electric, spinning electric drill blade, um, raw throat, and that's kind of the worst of it. So with the stomach laceration, it was, it was okay. It didn't cause any problems after that. No, because it didn't go through. Yeah. If it, okay. if it fully went through, then it would be bad. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure of that. Yeah. And so doing the 17 swords, was that something you spent months of preparation to develop or was it just uh, kind of an addition to what you were working on already? Uh, well, it was. it's all a progress, isn't it? So, yeah, you don't just get on a bike and do a, and do a marathon. You've got to learn to ride first. And so, so learn to swallow a sword or put it in a show and then it was a simple sword swallow. And then uh, I find if you get good enough to put something in a show and then you, you you're re performing regularly then you get really good at it so so that's yeah. kind of been my kind of go-to with uh learning skills all my life as well because it's like okay so if i can learn to juggle seven balls okay okay i've got them up in the air or if i put it in the show that means i'm doing it every day and then you get good at it so super tight yeah exactly yeah. that i mean it can also be a problem if you're putting the show every day because you tend not to train other stuff with it it tends to become really good at this thing but then the other stuff kind of diminishes right uh as long as you keep adding variety to your training and you keep uh, you know mixing up your shows all the time then then uh, yeah you can get good at a lot of things Okay, so the first two world records you did, you hung away from from the end of the blade, from the end of the handle, I take it, and then just basically... Yeah, used... so it was a weightlifting bar welded to the handle of a sword, and then on the end of the two bar, at the end of the bars, was a uh, chain with a big gas canister, big gas canisters, and then they had flamethrowers in the gas canisters. So and I've got a trigger here. So when I when I when I swallow it, when I let go, I press the button and then it sprays out all these huge flames, 
and then I press it and it turns off as it goes down. Yeah. Are you afraid when you're doing this stuff? Uh, no, no, not really. More, uh, it's more a rush and more kind of excited, I guess. I mean, there is uh, a bit of kind of fear, I guess, involved, but that is more kind of in the first training process. But if you're if you're scared to do it, by the time you're doing it in a show, you probably sh shouldn't be doing it. <laughs> Fair enough. I've seen you do lots of really interesting promo shots really you know in a shark tank swallowing a fluorescent tube and you seem to have really really good quality promo stuff is that something that you farm out to other people to design and develop or is that something you have an idea of yourself and then you you work with people to achieve that uh a bit of both so i guess um so that um underwater shark tank sw swallow was for a publicity stunt for our Happy Side Show. Oh, no, actually, no. No, I think that was my solo shows at the Sydney Opera House. And, um, yeah, was like, okay, so I'm doing this run of shows and I need to do a, some big publicity thing. So I did the – so it was the world's first underwater sword swallow. And I was like, okay, so it can't be enough to do it in a swimming pool. So I contacted the Manly Aquarium, which is this big uh, shark – tank the stingrays and sharks and like <laughs> giant sharks it was that was a, a real rush actually uh it was quite i mean it's a huge tank as well so and this this sharks don't tend to really swim around you too much unless you're really still and you've been in there for ages but i'm at the top i'm not breathing with a regulator or anything so i'm just kind of holding my breath swimming to the bottom i hook my weight under a under a, a strap on the floor hook my foot under weight and then uh, swallow the sword. And so I've got to blow air out as I swallow the sword so that the, all the, my stomach doesn't fill up with water. And so I had to do that like, or maybe 10 times in order to get the, the shark in, in the shot. <laughs> and did yeah. you have any close moments? Was the shark just staying clear of you and you trying to get him close or did he come up to you at some uh, point? Yeah, so quite often we were like, oh, he's coming, he's coming. And then so I'd, so I'd dive down, I'd do it, and they're like, oh, no, he, he was already t he'd already turned around by the time i make a little splash and he's gone. So, yeah. And and that literally just came up from the idea of, I need to do this, I want to do this, there's this thing here, right, I'll do this. It wasn't a long conceptualised process of, wouldn't it be great for this bit? And it, it was more of a, a thing which came from being put on the spot of having to do something. Uh, yeah, but I've always had kind of, sketchbooks and little, little pads where I'm constantly writing ideas and lines and ideas and and uh, yes yeah, so I, I just drew a sketch of me underwater with uh, and then swallowing a sword and so I was like oh well, there may as well be a shark in the picture and I was like oh wow imagine if I could actually do that and so I was just really lucky that I found the right aquarium who allowed me in and yeah and I suppose the, the the kind of hidden thing within this this whole conversation right now is you played in the Sydney Opera House. I mean, that's a huge, huge venue. I mean, what's the capacity for the Sydney Opera House? Uh, it, there's a bunch of venues in the Sydney Opera House. So okay. I definitely wasn't in the huge, giant... No, so you weren't theme, playing in the hall. Doing, doing, my, doing my, my solo show. Um, but it, it's very prestigious just to get in there yeah i did uh two seasons with my solo show and we did three seasons with the happy side show wow that's great man yeah. and so you went to this event the world record breaking event you broke two world records what happened after that oh well after that i kind of got in with chris sheedy the, the guinness world records guy and, was, and then he got me on a, a breakfast tv show i was like oh i want to break more records and then uh he called me up and said, "Oh, so what? What have you got? I've got this. Um, it's I've got Sunrise Breakfast TV show. I fly to Sydney, and then I was like, yep, okay, um, I'm gonna I'm gonna do this.' And it was the the most juggling catches while while oh no, the most sword swallowed while while juggling, and uh, so I did that. And then then uh, I contacted him again. I was like, oh, I, I love that so much. Um, uh, what other TV shows have you got? And he's like, oh, we're doing a, a TV show in in, in Italy." And I was like, oh, okay, great. Well, I've got this new act where um, I can pull a car with six girls in it and a pile of cement slabs 
weighs 411 kilograms with hooks in my eyes. I was like, oh, that's, that sounds great. And then so they flew me to Italy and I broke that record. And, and then... Um, and so you're, yeah. you're essentially, there's two things you're providing here. You're providing content for the book, you're making records, but you're also putting together shows, set pieces that they can then present. And this is the relationship you had with them, right? Uh, oh, not, not shows. Oh, so basically, oh, so the Guinness, Guinness World Record shows, there's different ones all around the world. So basically they... they uh, they hire out their, their name and their adjudicators to come to a production companies like TV TV show that they call Guinness World Record Show, but it's owned by all these different kind of production shows. And so, uh, but I had I had my foot in the door. So, so yes. Yeah, so I, and I so would would the production company go to Guinness and say we want a record? Do you have any ideas? And they go, yeah, well, actually, yeah. And then that would recommend me, yeah. Okay, and then so, that's a, a great doorway for you to go and break as many records as possible because you just have to think of bits and then they can link you with production companies that want to basically pay you. Exactly, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, great. And so yeah. so you, you formed a relationship with this guy and that relationship continued. He just kept doing more records and more records and more records, right? Yeah, and then we oh, so, so i started also i started collecting uh, unusual oddities as well so uh, kind of my collection specializes in mutations so i've got rows of jars of siamese twin siamese twin pigs i've got two taxidermy two-headed cows one's a full body uh, mount and another one's a, a head mount of a two-headed calf um, uh, a cyclops lamb in my freezer i've got <laughs> cycl uh, Two-headed lamb, extra limbs, and uh, hip chickens, and all this uh, preserved specimen, specimens of. Um, Why did you mutations. feel compelled to start collecting this stuff? Uh, I guess just because of my love of sideshow and freak shows, and uh, I kind of knew that I wanted to make something of it. So I. I yeah, I just I had, originally I just had a few pieces and I was just like, oh wow, this is this is so cool, and I, I just want to kind of expand and just keep collecting. I found this um a double body duckling with two full bodies and one head, and and then from then I was just like, oh, I just kind of want to focus my collection and and money on uh, buying uh, mutations, and then so. Am I right anyway, in I thinking there's a there was a chicken? in america that lived for something like a year or two years once it had its head cut off a guy used to yeah 18 months pet. mike the headless chicken yeah you have him right <laughs> oh i did i did but i've, I've sold him now yeah <laughs> there was there like these big collector scenes for these biological oddities and you're kind of all selling and swapping and moving things yeah, around yeah. between you all yeah and um yeah so, so, oh, so, what, so what was the question there was something about we were why so we're talking, talking about the Guinness World Records going next, but I want to address this before we move on. You opened a museum. Oh yeah, so, so we had right? I had my museum. So we, we made this show on the on the Thames uh, at the waterfront. Um, Was that the Underbelly the, in the big Thames? The, the London Underground. Yeah, okay. and so for for a couple of years they got asked as the entrance, which was. Uh, I had two venues. One was our freak show cabaret, which was kind of like a. Uh, more tr traditional kind of sideshow. Was that sideshow uh, superstars, but, if I remember correctly? Oh, uh, um, the royal family of strange people. So we had this, which was the Spiegel tent show, which was the lizard man, um, Matt Fraser, the seal boy. Um, uh, Amar is a one meter tall stand up comedian, and myself and my partner Zoe does acrobatic angle grinding and the ladder of swords and. Uh, uh, Julie Atlas Muse who had a giant albino python and anyway it was this so we had this um, Spiegel tent show then we had this um, side show which which you pay five pounds to come in which was the entrance to the, the Wonderground so we, we do chainsaw juggling whip cracking out the front with the microphone and gather around gather around and then we bring them in and then we let them out into the Wonderground so we've got an entrance door and the exit door is into the festival and uh, and then when you go in there, then we've got my museum in there as well. So uh, it was a bit of a challenge getting a bunch of my stuff to the UK. But I was going to say the, the um, logistics of it, get, get it there and back. 
yeah, it was a logistic nightmare, but it, it worked. I had to um, limit what I brought there. And, and anyway, I was, so, so I had a museum. We had our Spiegel tent show and the sideshow. And, and then Guinness World Records came. And, and they were like, uh, I was, uh, yes, or maybe I contacted them. I was like, oh, I, I, we've got this show here and we want to break a world record. And then they're like, oh, okay, great. We've got this new TV show. And so we ended up doing like 12 episodes um, filming on site at, at our okay. venue. So, um, and were you and being plus, paid for that or was it because you wanted the records? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, being paid. Yeah. Okay. So it was a high, and yeah. they, you were paid by Guinness for that? Uh, no, I was paid by the TV production company. The production company, yeah. And once again, Guinness yeah. is licensing the name. Yeah, no, the Guinness World Records um, is uh, a records keeping uh, business. They, they don't pay people code. to do so. Unless you go to do a show for one of their you know, gatherings or something like that. But, it's, but if you're on a, any of their shows, it's not actually their shows. Yeah. yeah, it's just the titles given. And what records did you break? Uh, so there, I, I broke the uh, the most chainsaw juggling back crosses, uh, the, the most uh, chainsaw juggling high throw pirouettes. So we we're just using a lot of the props that we had there, but also uh, the furthest distance travelled, uh, balancing a running lawnmower on the chin. Um, uh, what else? Uh, the most flowers whip cracked out of the mouth in a minute. Um, yeah, did a whole bunch of records there, but then also. We had other performers who were breaking records at the time as well. So Aman, the, the, the one metre tall stand-up comedian, he became the Guinness World Record official smallest uh, stand-up comedian. Uh, then we had a, a bottle walker who would walk across bottles and uh, with the, on tippy toes and then she got the record for that. So it was just kind of like this kind of fun uh, exchange when we were there doing shows, but then we, at, we made it kind of part of the of the crowd building thing where the Guinness adjudicators there and the, the camera crew is there and we're gathering an audience who did it. Yeah, we broke the record. Okay, now everyone inside. And we, <laughs> well, there's a huge yeah, amount of status for that, isn't there, as well? This is going to be a world record. It's, it's, this moment is going to be unique. This is going to be something yeah. you won't see again. And it's, it's novel and a spectacle because it's the most something's ever done of something or the first time this is done of something. It's a great vehicle to sell something. Yeah, yeah, it's a good... It's been, it's helped me get a lot of gigs over the time as well because I, I kind of like... For festivals, I'm like, okay, well, if you book me, then for an extra fee, we can uh, break a world record as part of the promo thing. And um, so that's kind of... So, you, so you've integrated it within your, your sales pitch of yourself as a performer is that we have this avenue because you have such a close relationship with Guinness that we can break a record at your event and we'll find a record to do. Yeah. Well, also I've got uh, maybe 300 open applications with Guinness World Records. Are you paying for all those applications? Because I know it's something like a £1,000 an application or something incredible, isn't it? No, no. <laughs> no, it's, it's free to make an application. Although, uh, if you want to make a new record, which isn't a current uh, Guinness World Record title, then it costs five pounds. Okay, to, that's not bad. To not to not not to have it, but in order to apply for it, for them to decide whether you can have it as an as an open application or not. Okay, yeah. cool. So, and and it so all used to be free, but now it's five pounds. So. I got all the numbers up when it was free. <laughs> just yeah, so now I've got them in the I got them in the backlog, and so I've just got this list of things where I'm like, so if people contact me, they're like, oh, can you break a world record here? Like, okay, well, these are the things that I'm ready to do today. Yeah. And so some of the stuff you'll still be working on, but it's in the list, and some of the stuff you have, and it's like, right, pick one. We've got this much. Yeah, there's a bunch there that that I can I can do right now where I've got the props ready to go. Uh, or I can go to a hardware shop and I can do it. Or uh, there's other ones where it takes a lot more preparation, where I need to hire cranes or uh, hire, depending on where I am in the world, hire a space to, to train it and work on it. And yeah, so it depends. Yeah. Yeah. And are you the person with the most Guinness World Records at this point? Have you have you no, crossed no. that? No. So I've got 55 Guinness World Records. Uh, there's Sharita Furman, who I believe is still the current 
uh, record holder for the most records, an American uh, enthusiast who breaks records for everything. So some of his records are quite impressive, but a lot of them are like the, 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 uh, the fastest time to blow a postage stamp. Uh, it, it, it like ten meters, the distance or something to blow, like, like just go, like, yeah, crazy ones of balancing the pool cue when you got to travel ten meters or something like that. So he just I looks for things that people haven't thought about, basically, and like I can do that. Yeah, yeah. Or, or ones that are already there, but then it's like, oh, okay, yeah, I can beat that. But I just wanted to specifically have kind of high skill or dangerous or crazy stunts. You don't want to just so do novelty been, for the sake of it. Yeah, although I have done some novelty ones because they've, they've asked me to do it. So, uh, so I've ta a gaffer taped the host on the officially amazing Guinness World Record show. I gaffer taped him to the side of the Spiegel tent wall um, and uh, with the faster time to gaffer tape someone to a wall. Huh. Uh, the most uh, juggling, uh, the most bites taken from an apple while, while juggling three apples. So but that's, that's still got some skill to it. There's still an element. It's still, uh, it's still high skill, and, and it was yeah. fun to do, but it's not my style of world record breaking. So I did that as a request from them. It's like, yeah, can you can you do something that's more family friendly? Yeah. It's not something you'd, you'd identify with or be driven to, but you're still happy to do it. It's not like you're precious yeah. with it in that way. Yeah. So you got 55 records. You're, you did the stuff at the in London with the museum. Did you open a museum up in Australia at the same time? Did you have a yeah, stand yeah. museum? Or, or my museum's a touring museum to art okay. festivals and, uh, and just events and things around. So the, the, my, I haven't done that many gigs with it over the last few years, but I guess COVID and all that. But, Not many people have. Um, so, yeah, the last one was at the Sydney Museum, which is quite prestigious, which is really cool to Very have much. kind of recognised as as a, an actual collection, you know? Yeah, that's yeah. really cool. And so what did you do after London? What was the next step in the story from where we left it off from doing the two, the world records and doing the six shows and doing the show there? What did you do after that? Uh, oh, after the Wonderground shows. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, so this is, so we've already finished the Happy Side show. Now now I'm touring my mind reading show. We're making, uh, my partner and I, Zoe, so she does, um, aerial straitjacket escapes and sword ladders and acrobatic angle grinding and stuff like that and she's great at uh organizing groups and uh yeah making playlists and she's just kind of really good at all the admin stuff and so i'm kind of the front man and then she does all the the extra bits and uh yeah so we've had quite successful uh touring kind of group shows and things like that so our current one is uh, called deja voodoo and it's a freak show cabaret which is we've got the lizard man sort of tattoo green and uh, phoebe blue the cabaret singer and fire eater and lays on the bed of nails well uh, bathing herself in flames and singing and, and uh, uh shannon jones shoots an arrow through the feet and um yeah so it's kind of a high skill uh sideshow based uh, freaky cabaret fun and yeah. you don't worry about you and your partner working together and living together and embedding too much in your life that's not a concern <laughs> you, you work well together right well, we do work well together but you know working with your partner and living and everything has its challenges as well um, but we've also got our own things as well so I mean I still do my solo shows still have the museum I uh, know I'm, I'm obsessed with painting, so, so why I've always you, just got my own thing. You've got you've got this successful career as a performer. You do freak show performing um, to a high level all around the world. You've got 55 Guinness World Records. Why become a painter? Uh, well, that started in COVID, actually. Well, I've always liked drawing, and I've painted a lot of kind of jackets and costumes and things over the years. And then when COVID hit, it was like maybe a couple of months in, we just had this little bubble of, of a few friends. That we would visit each other, even though we weren't really meant to, but we were like, okay, as long as you're not seeing anyone. Blah, blah, blah. And then, so our friends came over and we got all my daughter's paints out and we all just sat on the floor and had some boards and we just started painting. I was like, wow, 
I actually love this and I'd never painted on a canvas before. And then, so I just started buying canvases and boards and, and uh, within, uh, within a year I'd painted, <laughs> I'd painted like a hundred paintings and then I opened up a gallery in Byron, which was a bit tricky with, uh, with the, with COVID and everything. And so, so I did some, did some events where it was kind of like just out of lockdown and uh, they were a real success. And then I, I've, I got my first art dealer. And then so now I'm in multiple galleries and, and selling. Yeah, I'm currently making uh, 10 pieces, which I'm about to send to Singapore. And then I'm making uh, two pieces uh, for, uh, for, for the States. And so I'm just sending, sending paintings all around. And, uh, I, I love it. <laughs> I can't stop painting. And now I'm like, oh, do I, I get a gig and I'm like, oh, do I want to, do I want to leave or do I just stay here and paint? Yeah. And <laughs> do you think that the, the dedication you applied to performance, you've applied that dedication equally during lockdown when you didn't have the ability to perform, I assumed you were still training. Did you apply that and move that then into painting? And this was like, right, this is the new thing. This is a new set yeah, of goals definitely. I'm going to set myself. Yeah, wh whatever I'm, I'm into, I, I'm obsessed with, I guess. So it's just part of my nature. This is one of my, one of my quirks. So, so yeah, so, so I paint every day um, and try to just mix that with family life. And, and uh, but I, I guess I, I always just want to do what makes me happy. And for many years, what, made me happy was like oh i have to go to the next city i have to go to the next country i have to always be performing and now oh, i'm not going to uh throw away all my performing props but <laughs> but i'm really enjoying painting uh but also i like uh I'm, at the moment i'm, I'm mixing uh, performance with with my art so uh for the opening of, of some of my gallery shows I do, do a big event where, yeah, I've got musicians and circus performers as part of the kind of theme because part of my theme of a lot of the paintings is carnivals and circuits and I paint uh, performers and stuff. And then, um, I, so I do an act on a 1 million volt Tesla coil, which is one of the Guinness World Records I've got, the, the longest lightning bolts to shoot from the fingertips. And so anyway, I put a million volts of electricity through my body. It's a... A high voltage transformer, which is basically an upside down bucket covered in copper coils on top of a bunch of transformers. And anyway, I, I take I it you didn't make it yourself. I take you got an engineer to create this for you. You didn't just do it in your back garden. <laughs> I made it with my friend, the, the great Boltini, who's uh, in in the UK, and he's he's actually uh, a sword swallower from Kamikaze Freak Show as well. So one of my inspirations uh, for sword swallowing. So he's not a sword swallower anymore, but he does. Uh, make uh, high voltage machines, and uh, yeah, he's a, a genius in his own right. And so he's so basically yeah. So he's made me this machine, which is unique in the world because it's completely tuned to my body mass. So I can stand on top, and without wearing any Faraday suits, which is a like a metal cage. So I don't need any metal cage. All the electricity goes through through my flesh blood and bones and then exits out my fingertips spraying a meter streams of electricity giant electrical arcs for my fingers and then so when i use this at my gallery shows i so i show the high voltage coming out of my body uh and then swallow a sword spray lightning out of the sword um and then hold a painting so i paint a, a skeleton on a standing on a tesla coil with his hands in the air I've, I've got some wire screwed in on the sides and then it stabs through where their hands are. And, uh, and so when I hold the wire, the electricity goes through my body, through my arms, through the wire, and then exits out where the skeleton's hands are and burns all these beautiful fractal burn marks and then sprays electricity out the top of the, the board. And uh, it's like kind of like a giant electrical display while creating uh, visual art uh, in a performance. Yeah. yeah. And as well as the art that's created in that moment, it, it really solidifies the spectacle of you as an artist, you as a character. So all the people going in who are perhaps thinking about buying a painting you're doing, one of the things I think artists uh, 
buyers of art love is they love the story behind the artist. I'm exactly. Buying, yeah, it helps me a lot. Yeah. Exactly this. And you create this amazing uh, image that people can fill all the, the other background details into. Yeah. If you've got a colorful, colorful background, it can help you in any, uh, any, in any pivot that you have in your career. If you, so for instance, my partner's uh, done an interior design degree, which is just finished. So she's having a break and then uh, over the new years, and then we'll be like, okay, hey, now what do I want to do? And, but because she's got her career as like circus and sideshow and, uh, world traveling festival uh, venue organizer and uh, it really helps you know she's designed venues designs stages designs a whole bunch of stuff and so she's got all this background which is kind of really intriguing for people so it really and it's, it's helped my art career as well it's, yeah i'm sure the awareness of that as well painting, they're like okay what's the what's the history behind that painting yeah so I've got these uh, paintings that I did a series of uh, paintings that were created by a unicycle. So instead of a paintbrush, I used my unicycle. So, uh, so I've got, it's a three meter tall unicycle. So I laid it down. So when COVID happened, I wasn't using the unicycle anymore. So I took the wheel off and made it so that instead of spinning the wheel, it would spin boards and canvases. And then so I stand right over there and I start cranking the pedal, the, the board spinning and then I'd throw paints at it and kind of just got really messy and creative fun and I ended up making these kind of big uh, giant skull paintings and things like that, all with centrifugal force. And, so yeah, you're really so doing really experimenting? Well. <laughs> yeah, it's all, it's all experimenting, I guess. But even, even I've always felt like that with, with my shows as well because everything is, is part of the progression of... of you know where you where you're going, where you, where you what you want to become. It's it's always experimental. That's what kind of keeps it fun and and interesting. Yeah, and it definitely seems like through your career you've constantly searched for new things. You've tried. You've not sat on your laurels. You've not thought this works. That's enough. You've constantly been driving for new goals. Yeah, yeah, and I guess that's part of what I got from my from my father with all the goal setting when I was a kid. <laughs> Yeah, exactly this. So where do you see yourself in the future? Do you see yourself slowly phasing out performance? It sounds a bit like that. And then moving more towards the quiet life of an artist. I'm definitely on a new, a new path, which I would have, uh, before COVID, I would never have thought that, <laughs> which is kind of amazing because I, yeah, I, I, before COVID, I'd never painted on canvas. And now it's... I just want to paint every day. So, uh, yeah, I'm very surprised myself, and and uh, yeah, I just I just love it. So I don't know. I, I my my goals for the future. I mean, I I feel like I've achieved a lot, and yeah, I no I just love there. being in my hometown. I love uh, you know I've got a family now. My daughter's nine years old, and I grew up in this town. I'm really glad that she's here growing up too because it's such a beautiful area. And, yeah, I don't know. I just like being around here. And I think, yeah, unless you live in Vegas or somewhere where you can do do shows all the time because like, there's not that many shows here. You, uh, like there's a theatre down the road and I can book that out. But you only want to do it, you know, two or three times a year. You can do a little run of shows. Uh yeah, or I can just paint paintings in the shed and uh, and then go to a few gallery showings and do some performances and 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 just really enjoy life and that's what I'm doing at the moment. So, <laughs> and so it seems like you're for one, it seems like the traveling life is slowly becoming less appropriate for you, less less something which you you yearn for. It sounds like right. Yeah, well, I guess I used to be. Like, uh, I've got to go to a, an, uh, you know, so many different countries this year. I want to, you know, expand my my travel repertoire. And, uh, yeah, now I don't have the urge to do that anymore. So I've, I've even lost count of how many countries I've performed in. But it's over fifty. But I don't know. I don't know how many. <laughs> yeah. And, and you, yeah, you don't feel if like I'm on holiday. 
Oh, what was that? I said, do you feel like you still need that? Or is that something that's, it sounds like it's it's dwindling within you, that will and desire to be on the road and go and see new places. Uh, yes, it is. Yeah. I yeah, don't have the urge for it anymore. Although there's always festivals I want to go to, you know, like Glastonbury Festival and Burning Man. It's like, okay, yeah, I, I want to go back there again. Yeah, I do still love travelling, but I don't have the the drive for it as I as before. Fair enough. And so, you see yourself in the future becoming a painter and living a settled life. What what a wonderful way to end what seems like an incredibly exciting life. You know, to settle down, be with a family, and paint and go to a few galleries. So I, I feel like we've really we've covered a huge amount in the interview. So. I'm going to start asking you some of the just final questions. And these are broad questions for people who might be street performers yeah. listening. So first of all, do you have any advice for people who are starting street performance, who are, who are trying to get the most out of their life as a street performer? Yeah, I guess go somewhere where there's a good pitch because if you can't work regularly, then your street show is not going to be, not going to get solid. Uh, street shows need expectation, I guess. So that's kind of the biggest part of what I've learnt in my street performing career is that unlike theatre shows, you need to you need to really show people about what's about to happen. There always needs to be what's next. <laughs> Why are they sticking around? Uh, I guess so. Al Miller has this uh, course out, the Ultimate Street Performer, which is uh, which is pretty amazing. I've never seen such an in-depth look at street shows. So if anyone was getting into street shows, I'd probably say that's a great investment to make. Um, yeah, or even if you are a street performer who wants to uh, get get better at what you do, it's just a new way of thinking of it, I guess. So yeah, highly recommended for that. Um, yeah, there's so much, <laughs> it's such a wide topic, isn't it? I mean, very, like, very broad topic. Uh, what advice on street performers, like <laughs> get a sound system, <laughs> like, yeah. And what do you think system. about yeah. creativity in the craft? I mean, you're someone who seems like you've constantly strived to do new and different and interesting things. Do you think street performance as a craft is generally creatively bankrupt or do you think there's incredible vibrancy do you think there's ways we could have a more creative world on the street if it isn't already uh well i guess people don't have to take on their performance career like i have you know people have very successful careers doing one act their whole life uh it's never something that i wanted to do or or strive to do but and maybe that's been to my detriment. Maybe my life would have been way easier if I was just like, okay, I worked on one act and get, and, and then it would be, you know, shit hot. It's exactly the same every time. People know what they're getting. It's like the, uh, like McDonald's or something. But, but you know, it wor it, it works. And, um, and there, there is creativity in that as well because you're always kind of honing it and, and there's, there's something really beautiful about that, of keeping it really simple and doing something so many times that it's, it's priceless. I mean, I even, we were talking about Captain Frodo before and you know, he's, he's got heaps of acts and he's had an amazing creative career, but his tennis racket act has been almost the same for you know, 20 it's, years. And it's it's such right, a beautiful don't, don't change it, eh? Yeah, it's such a beautiful piece. I mean, he has honed it over the years and it, it is changing, but it's so subtle and it's just like, it's such a perfect act. And I mean, he could just do that act for the rest of his life and not do any of the other things, but oh, if, his body, if his body kept up. <laughs> well, it's, it's very interesting to watch and you can see this in some people where they've honed something to the point where you can tell there's no fat on there, there's nothing useless, no superfluous kind of elements within it. Everything has a reason and a function. It's just this beautifully constructed mechanism. Yes. Yeah, it's been really cool listening to Frodo's 
uh, blogs as well. Have you seen those? The way of the show. The way. The way of the showman, yeah, yeah it's exactly. really interesting, interesting. Uh, philosophy take on uh, showmanship, and yeah, it's really beautiful. It makes you think about performance in a different way. Check it yeah, out. So check it out. <laughs> and the last thing to ask is: there anything you'd like to say to the people that you've travelled with and seen on? And this is kind of a throwback from COVID, where we're all stuck in a house. So say, is there anything you want to say? Yeah. To anyone? But it does seem like quite a natural, reasonable end. Do you? want to say anything to the people you've traveled on people you might not have seen for a long time who you've met on your way busking around the world well i haven't finished traveling yet so i hope to see you all again soon and yeah i still plan to come back to the uk and see all the old friends i mean there's so many yeah it's been such a pleasure having you know all these performers and just my family for so many years and even if i don't see these people for so long, like whenever you see them or or chat to them online, it's like it's like there was no there was no time apart. It's just yeah, it's it's really beautiful having such a an amazing performing family around the world. Cool, so man, thank well. you everyone. <laughs> and I'd like to say, Shane, to you, thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you for the interview. It's been fascinating. You've shared some really amazing stuff and I, I've appreciated every minute and sure everybody in the uh video and in the chats and say the same thing i hope you have a really good day buddy and thank you for your time oh, thank you you're welcome. and uh oh, to, to close off I, I wanted to show you one of my paintings so it's a it's a painting on canvas of a, a snow leopard although it's not just a painting it's also a piece of digital art so it's spray paint acrylic paint paint pen uh, on canvas but if you hold your phone up to it it comes it moves wow yeah so this is it's what amazing. i've been doing with a whole bunch of my work so i so i do a gallery show with like you know a solo show with like 50 40 or 50 paintings and you walk around and hold your phone up to all the different paintings and they all do do different things like this and so, when people buy the yeah, paintings, do they get the app and they can do that at home? They can go, hey, guys. Yeah, the animation comes permanently attached to the artwork. Yeah. Okay. Wow, that's amazing. Thank you for yeah. sharing with us. <laughs> no worries. Thank you, buddy. You even Thank got you. a piece of artwork at the end to see everyone. Yeah. Cool, oh, buddy. my daughter. <laughs> Hey, mate. All right. Lots of love, Have everyone. Have a good one, Betty. It's been a pleasure. Thanks, Everybody, thank you for watching. Catch you soon, everyone. Have a good one. Goodbye.